My cousin rapped like the No Limit, like Master P type rapper, so I was imitating him. <laughs> Terrible stuff I wasn't even doing. Then I started telling stories more, and I started leaning more toward Nas, or like a Tupac who I had already loved. But I fell in love, more in love with the way they told stories, and that's kind of how I evolved. I stopped like just rapping about how much better I am than you. In this clip from an interview that took place at the outset of his career, J. Cole neatly summarizes how he found his own lane in terms of both his rapping and distinct production style. Before he learned about the instrumentation that makes up one of the crucial components of the art that we know as hip hop, it was lyricism that initially ignited a young Jermaine Cole's mind. Once he first picked up the pen at age 12, Cole started out like most of us in that he looked to emulate that which he idolized. Molded by the contemporary musical environment that he was in during those formative years, Cole's early days as an artist were defined by following familiar patterns and flows. But courtesy of the fact that he was by no means an overnight sensation, Cole had the time to mentally let go of his hero's coattails and that meant that when he had to unveil his craft to the masses, he had an acute sense of who he was as an artist that's often missing from today's rappers that have to accelerate their careers due to social media blowing them up. So by the time I I got to come up the warm up, which was my first two mixtapes, the warm up being classic and being heralded by my fans. I was so locked into who I was stylistically, it didn't sound like nobody. I had been through the phase of trying to sound exactly like cannabis when I was 14, 15 and mm. Eminem. And then I had been through the phase of trying to sound like Nas. And I had been through the phase of Jay and all of that shit melted in a pot and made me who I was. So when I dropped warm up, when it hit the people's ears, it was so refreshing because it was so original right. and it wasn't happening at the time. You got a storytelling rapper then who really got bars, who really is hard. And re Friday Night Lights was a continuation of the warm up. It was also the first time I started experimenting and then trying to expand. OK, well, let me try to do something. And that was heralded as a classic, too. But it's a perfect balance of that cold style and then a little bit of me trying some new shit. As he outlined during this conversation with the late great Combat Jack, Cole's time spent under the learning tree of the artist in his CD player or iPod at the time didn't necessarily make him who he was, but that studious approach allowed him to identify a pocket of his own that he's been forging ahead with ever since. As opposed to being limited to his bars, he similarly heeded the work of the greats in order to mold his production style. For starters, he took cues from his time in battle rap in order to inform his sensibilities as a producer. Not in terms of levels, he said, of the competitive environment's impact on his style to music radar, but in terms of the dirtiness. When I was doing battle stuff, I wanted the drums disgusting sounding. I'd loop these super old break beats that were as dirty as I could find them and then I'd put hard drums on top. Even now, to this day, if I'm doing a beat with a dirty drum loop, it will have a really hard, loud kick on top that really snaps. First, given the opportunity to produce when his mother spent $1,300 on an ASRX for her aspiring musician son, this extravagant purchase would prove to be an investment in his future, which permitted his steadily advancing pen game to be accompanied by a steady stream of beats. Later, this would be made all too evident when he produced nearly 70% out of a total of 42 tracks across The Come Up and Friday Night Lights. Now, if you yourself are an artist or producer who would like to learn the step-by-step -step secrets of J. Cole's songwriting and production methods, click the first link in the video description to gain access to our four-hour masterclass on hit records and hot beats, which comes as a free bonus when you sign up on that link. But although he's arguably more renowned as a recording artist, Cole has always strived for parallel growth in every area of his career ever since the work of one of Virginia's finest beat makers enticed him like nothing else. The first time I got interested in how to make something was listening to Timbaland Productions, trying to figure out how he did those things. He recalled, couldn't even fathom where you would get started, but I was interested. On Aaliyah's third album, the song More Than A Woman was so next level to me. I just sat there trying to imagine how he did it. 
Although he initially fixated on the samples, Cole would change his approach under the advice of another legend, declaring that, I watched a Pete Rock interview and he was like, I always start with the drums first. At first I couldn't imagine it, but it stuck with me, so one day I started drums first and it changed the whole trajectory of my career as a producer. And ever since then, he's been keeping an eye out on improvement in every area of his career, as to this very day, he's still fixated on fulfilling the ambitions that he laid out in his early days in Fayetteville. Tell the world, get called the producer. They don't know yet. Well, before it's all said and done, they're gonna find out I'm patient, man. And I'm understanding I had to get myself to a certain place first to be able to have the time to tap into my producer side. Right now, I only got time to produce for myself. You know what I mean? But, but you made a lot of hits for yourself. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm blessed. I'm lucky to be able to do that. But the next phase and the next chapter is to produce hits and albums for other people. That's why the retrieval with the label. It's a beautiful thing because I got artists under me that are self-sufficient right but I'm still waiting on that day to be able to absolutely embrace and Dr. Dre a whole project, or you know what I mean? Or Timberland a whole project like you did with Aaliyah. And that's really what I'm looking for. In this clip, we see that from his younger days, his Dreamville label already existed within the terrain of his mind long before it had Interscope's backing as a real imprint. Courtesy of his far-reaching abilities, the fact that he always envisioned himself as a multi-hyphenate across production, rapping, and nurturing new talent has meant that he had to improve his skill set in preparation and naturally, the key to that was to ensure that when his unsung talents behind the boards could be finally called upon, he'd be more than ready to enact what he dreamed of, no pun intended, for all of those years. In Cole's words, it would appear that if you don't actually put in the time to do what you've always hoped to do, then you'll be ill-prepared when the moment to unveil the sheer scope of what you're capable of actually arises. And in an industry that's as much of a pressure cooker as hip-hop is, failure to take advantage of opportunities when they're presented might as well be a cardinal sin. But as his fame conversation with a rapper, Lil Pump, that once decried him in a SoundCloud diss track would show, your understanding of the industry that you're in can't be allowed to skew your view and make you forget why you pursued this dream in the first place. Inspiration is everything. If I stop being a fan of this then I stop being inspired. You know what I mean? Part of going so hard, like Chief Key, Like who knows if you would've went so hard with this shit if you didn't love him so much, you know what I mean? If you didn't have somebody to look up to and to like dive into their shit and be like, yo, how does bro come up with these flows? Like, how does he say all this wild shit? So like, at a certain point I realized, man, I need to just be a fan again. I don't give a f if I'm just looking on random YouTubes or whatever, because one thing I noticed about some of my peers is they stay connected. They stay fans, like, they always know about, like, I be talking to these like, they be knowing about all type of artists. Like, I'm like, how the f you hear about him? You know what I mean? It's like they stay on it. In another astute insight from Cole, he makes it clear that one of the things that's allowed him to retain his enthusiasm for both producing and rapping is that he's never allowed the magic to elapse. As when you stop relishing the thrill of hearing new music or encountering new methods of working, you're bound to plateau and essentially find your expertise in artistry being capped at the moment you turn off your radar. It was this ravenous appetite for hip hop that allowed Cole to place trust in himself over time and keep his process simple. Back in the day, Cole admitted that he would often intellectualize the act of making hip hop in such a way that would lead him to add supplements supplementary bells and whistles to his work. But through staying connected with both himself and the vibration that hip hop sought at the time, he was eventually able to streamline the process and find his very own formula for success. When I really found a groove as a producer was around the time I did Lights Please, he revealed. I didn't have to try as hard. I trusted my instincts and I didn't have to add 100 drum sounds or samples on top of each other. I had a drum loop, a kick drum, a melody, a sample, and a snare. There's really four or five elements to that beat, and that's when I hit the level of confidence to not overdo things. That's when I started to hit that comfort level. Unwilling to let himself grow stagnant, Cole's creative cogs are always turning and he routinely works while on tour. In the case of the production of Born Center, he utilized his MacBook Pro to flesh out his concepts and then fine tune the project when he got back. While this may sound inherently difficult, Cole understands the need to challenge 
challenge himself wherever he can. When you put yourself in uncomfortable moments, you find out a lot about yourself. And usually you find out that you're capable of rising to that bar that's set by that uncomfortable situation. So what's something I can do? Yo, when somebody bring you a feature, say yes. I was looking at it like an opportunity for growth. Do you really want to look back and be like, you didn't work with nobody? You didn't have no songs with nobody. That You just cool with that. No, okay. So start saying yes to some features. In this clip, we see Cole elaborating on why he felt the need to discomfort himself in order to expand his legacy. Considering that he's Mr. Platinum with no features, Cole could have coasted within his own hermetically sealed format of working forever. But in 2018, he decided that it was really time to prove himself and ensure that an entrapping degree of familiarity didn't prove to be his undoing. So he pushed himself and in the process sculpted an immensely prolific feature run that became one of the biggest talking points of the latter stages of the 2010s decade. Along the way, he contended with production that was beyond his wheelhouse and collaborated with artists from across the length and breadth of the culture. Soon this would be the same ethos that would lead to the creation of Revenge of the Dreamers 3 and when you take a moment to recognize that the whole period essentially ushered in one of the most fruitful spells of his career, it attests to the fact that you always need to be striving to do more if you're going to make the most impactful and vital work that you can. During the sessions for Revenge of the Dreamers 3, Cole actually found himself encountering writer's block at first, but rather than allowing it to dishearten him to many degrees, it simply reminded him that greatness doesn't just materialize based upon your own pedigree. Instead, it requires focus and dedication. This is 2016. Four Seal Drive had been out. I'm at the peak. And I'm like, coming back here, this might be my last moment of moving how I used to move. Waking up every day dolo, just being able to write, focus on music. I came up here for like two months. Every morning I woke up, I had to write a verse before I can go to the city and go to the studio. And after the studio, got to drive all the way back, to wake up here, write again, record again, and then go. Now here from the Applying Pressure documentary that preceded the release of The Off Season, we see that a degree of discipline and regularity to producing and rapping has been a staple of his career since the very moment that he finally decided to devote his life to the art form. A firm believer in the notion that nothing will make you a true great other than putting in the time, Cole's tale of tapping back into the headspace that made him shows that there really is no substitute for devoting yourself to the beats, rhymes, and overall artistic direction of your work. However, what Cole makes clear later in that same mini documentary is that how you optimize your time might be different than someone else. So instead of looking for a one size fits all approach that won't necessarily serve you, the goal is to find a method that will allow your life to not infringe on your art and vice versa. As he explains, the demands that the world places on you outside of the studio evolve over time based upon factors in your life, but finding a methodology that can be stuck to is no less pivotal to fulfilling your potential and maximizing the quality of both the beats and rhymes you deliver. I remember Pharrell, one of the first times I had worked with him, he was like telling me how he had his life on a schedule. He came to the studio for certain hours. He was like, I only come to the studio from this time to this time and I don't take shit home with me. I was probably 24, 25 when he said that. And I remember feeling like, damn, that's weird because I'd be in the studio all day. If I stayed in the studio anything less than 12 hours before I had kids, it was a failure of a day. About two years into being a father, I remember, oh, you need a schedule where your family knows that this is your time in the studio and this is the time when I'm at home on family mode. It's something that I needed to do because I'm not going to shortcut on the family side. So I put the studio in the house for that reason. By heeding the words of Skateboard P, Cole made his own life vastly easier and by taking the steps that he needed to make, he has laid the groundwork for some of his most compelling verses and stunning beats to bubble to the surface in recent years. By denying himself the chance to do so based on his initial assessment of Pharrell's comments, then all he would have done is prohibit himself from finding something he could really benefit from. And as Cole has had to experience firsthand, there are times when you should stick to your guns and other times when trying to do something that doesn't artistically serve you can cause any artist to sell themselves short. My introduction to the people, to the mainstream crowd, just happened to be my first album, mm. which was the most 
reaching I've ever done. And when I listen back now, some songs 100% me. There's a few songs where I'm like, ah, oh, I hear it. I hear where I was reaching and trying to try a new flavor that I thought would get me to the people's ears easier. Right. Like still be myself, but let me add a little bit of this. Now when I listen back, ugh. And I think back to what Greg Knight said, no one would ever do that back in there. And I look, you can name a rapper right now and I could tell you a song and where they took it from. Right now it's like commonplace for people to snatch this flow, right. snatch this style. Right. It's commonplace in this day and age or whatever. And it wasn't like that before. So it's the first album where I got back to, there ain't no reaching. During his career spanning appearance on the Combat Jack show, Jermaine revealed that his youthful naivete meant that he fell into a familiar trap of straying from what he knew as his artistic realm in order to attempt to satiate the masses. On the sideline story, Cole learned the lesson the hard way, to the extent that even he had to suffer the scorn of one of his heroes, most notably on his single workout. My partner gets a call from No ID and he's like, yo, who approved this? Who's behind this? Cole said of the song. He finally did call me a week later and he was explaining to me like, to tell you the truth, I was in the studio with Nas, man, and he was like, yo, why the f did he make this? He don't know that he the one? I'm getting defensive, but I was really just hurt as a fan. I idolized that dude. I had his reps written on my walls. This story was of course immortalized by Cole on his track, Let Nas Down, but more importantly, by letting himself lose sight of what made him so gripping among the hottest prospects in the game, Cole denied himself of the classic album that he was so fixated on creating. And as a result, he's refused to do it since. Where the Cole of 2011 was malleable to what was going on around him, the Dreamville leader of today doesn't attempt to make music to satiate execs or chase trends. But even though he's revered as one of the finest MCs of his generation and a criminally underrated producer, he has had to ensure that if it's gonna stay that way, he has to stay on top of his artistry and above all else, retain the hunger that put him there in the first place. First of all, you get to this height or this level of your career in terms of platform, Who's to say the next one is next one might go down? Yeah. Could go up. You're never guaranteed to be this high again. Yeah. So at, while I'm here, let me use this opportunity to say the, the realest shit. I yeah, have ever sure. said. Absolutely. In case next time that's down here, when I got to the top of the mountain, you you said this is what the say. I'm gonna say. So yeah. that intention has been there and that purpose has been there. For sure. This conversation helps me because it lets me that the reason why it's hard to finish right now is because I've gotten away from that feeling. For me and it's coming, it's gone. And it's gotten me songs. And it's gotten me this song, and sometimes, been, sometimes I might listen to it like, like last week, I might listen to "Who Do You Love" and be like, "Yes, all of that shit comes back," and I'm like, "It's gonna do what it was intended to do," but then it'll go away. Why? Because I'm not putting myself in those positions that keep me feeling like that. I'm living a life that's very detached. Yeah. I'm not on social media. I'm not in the news. I don't click the headlines. It's family and music. So if I'm not allowing myself to feel what people are feeling, then of course I'm gonna lose sight of that original sure. inspiration. That's the yeah. only thing left to do is put myself back in there. It'll automatically happen. It'll automatically yeah. come. So whether it manifests in trying to keep up with the Joneses in a musical sense, or by attempting to soften your raw edges for success, or to turn off the sense of engagement with the world and culture that made you who you were, one of the main takeaways that intersects across all of Cole's hard-earned lessons is that complacency is a distraction destructive force. So if you ever want to reach your full potential, then the last thing you can permit yourself to do is get comfortable or coast. Because if someone as prolific as Cole is still refusing to do so, then none of us should. Now, I want to see you in the comments, which is your favorite song by Cole that he both rapped and produced on. And of course, if you're an artist or producer yourself, check out that four hour masterclass using Cole's songs in the video description. I've been your host, Drew Marcy, the big homie Drew for how to rap, and I'll see you on the next one.